I am E. Carmen Ramos, curator for Latino art, and it's a pleasure to introduce tonight's lecture with artist, writer, and professor Harry Gamboa, Jr. I'd like to thank the Smithsonian Latino Center for co-sponsoring this event, and particularly to Ranald Wooderman for inviting Harry to the museum, and Danny Lopez and Nona Martin for coordinating all facets of tonight's program. Since its inception in 1997, the Latino Center has worked collaboratively with the numerous centers and museums of the Smithsonian to advocate, sponsor, and spearhead a broad range of programs and initiatives that help foster the understanding and appreciation of Latino contributions to history, society, and culture. My own position as, cur as curator for Latino art at the Smithsonian American Art Museum was made possible due to the investment of the Latino Center. Since I arrived in Washington late last year, I've been working to expand the museum's Latino collection, which is one of the few of, the, of its kind in a non-culturally specific institution. Consisting of over 500 works of art, our collection includes works in all media and eras, from the colonial paintings and sculpture that speak to the Hispanic origins of life on this continent and Puerto Rico, to the work of graphic artists like Esther Hernandez that were inspired and influenced by the civil rights movement, as well as the avant-garde recycled films of Rafael Montañez Ortiz. In light of our initiative to expand our Latino holdings, it is apropos to have an artist and thinker of the likes of Harry Gamboa Jr. to speak to us about his boundary-defining artistic career. His expansive and influential works straddle his own lived experience during the turbulent social revolutions of the 1960s and 70s, as well as the avant-garde practices of performance and male art art forms in which he is a pioneering practitioner. Since 1972, Gamboa has been actively creating works in various media and forms that document and interpret the contemporary urban Chicano experience. For those of you not familiar with the term Chicano, it arose within the context of the civil rights and labor movements and was classically defined by the journalist Ruben Salazar in 1970 as a, quote, Mexican-American with a non-Anglo image of himself. Gamboa is probably best known for his work with the East Los Angeles performance-based art group that he co-founded called ASCO. The group, which, was originally, which originally included artists uh, Willie Jaron, Gronk, and Patsy Valdez, took their name from the forceful word for disgust and nausea in Spanish. They performed regularly in the street and public art scene from 1972 to 1987, staging a number of events that underscored the potentially explosive social conditions in Los Angeles. Since then, Gamboa has been dedicating himself increasingly to writing, as well as his own work as a photographer and media artist. Currently, he is a faculty member at the California Institute of Arts School of the Art Program in Art in Photography and Media. His work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, and his wide-ranging contributions as a key member of ASCO will be profiled in the highly anticipated exhibition ASCO, Elite of the Obscure, a retrospective, that will open the fall of this year at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. In tonight's talk, titled Erased, Limits and Borders, Gamboa will reflect on the social and personal conditions of Chicanos during the second half of the 20th century that led to the development of, of ASCO, as well as his own individual work that addresses issues of Chicano representation. Following his talk a short and a short question and answer period, I invite you all to meet Harry by the G Street lobby, where he will be signing copies of his books, Urban Exile, The Collected Writings of Harry Gamboa Jr., and Fallen, A Book of Poems which are available for purchase in our gift shop. And before I invite uh, Harry on stage, I want to, all, to remind you all to please turn off your cell phones. And without further ado, I'd like to invite Harry Gamboa to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everyone. Um, well, I often start at the beginning, and um, the beginning for me was 1951, uh, when I was born in Los Angeles, uh, which um, I was reminded of uh, earlier today with a, in the walk in the museum, there's a pastel drawing of a nuclear explosion, um, and um, it's very puffy, looks very kind of soft, almost like cotton candy. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles um, at the time of the start of the nuclear testing in Nevada, and uh, uh, all throughout my childhood, I was not exactly aware of the fact that uh, several hundred nuclear bombs were being exploded um, on a weekly basis uh, throughout uh, uh, my childhood. 
uh, resulting in fallout landing in Los Angeles. And I, I actually came across a document recently from a declassified um, report by the Atomic Energy Commission that uh, much of the milk that was served to the children of that era contained uh, radioactive particles, uh, which connected to the reason why I was constantly in attendance of funerals of my um, friends uh, who were dying of leukemia, and, um, but which kind of set the tone for my approach to doing my work, and that is that um, at a very early age, I kind of understood what it meant to be a survivor and what might necessarily, uh, what it might necessarily take also to fully embrace the concept of existentialism, uh, possibly 30 years before I read anything about existentialism. I kind of lived it and, um, and uh, was also part of the uh, new first generation to watch television, of uh, the television viewer generation. And living in East Los Angeles, um, which is um, several miles away from downtown Los Angeles, which uh, I often refer to as uh, operating very much like a separate country within a city, um, uh, East Los Angeles um, became sort of a very much of a focal point of my life uh, at the early stages uh, because of my um, interaction uh, not only with the uh, people who lived there, but also with the institutions that were represented uh, in that area, um, which again began very early on. Uh, my first uh, contact with the official institutions, of course, was in kindergarten. Um, and I attended a, a public school um, called Lorena Street School uh, in the early 50s um, that had been undergoing a demographic shift um, the neighborhood is known as Boyle Heights, had been a, um, a Jewish neighborhood, had been a Russian neighborhood, had been a Japanese American neighborhood, um, uh, very reflective of sort of the history of Los Angeles, uh, people always moving, shifting around, uh, much like uh, pawns in a chess game. Um, and when I attended my first day of elementary school, um, I encountered a group of people who weren't speaking the same language I was speaking because I entered that school being a monolingual Spanish-speaking student. And as it turns out, I was the only student uh, uh, in that situation. And um, at the time, California uh, was known as the Golden State. It was the state that had the highest per capita student spending. Um, there were endless supplies. Uh, Students could have anything they wanted. Even in the poorest schools, you had everything you needed. And uh, this was reflected on my first day because um, as I was introduced uh, uh, to the classroom uh, and I responded uh, basically saying something in Spanish, uh, the teacher immediately uh, brought me up and I felt that I was a star pupil immediately um, and was taken to the cabinet and was able to bring out a sheet of paper and um, I thought, you know, maybe I, I hit the jackpot. I've, I've entered an art school. Uh, and, um, and so on front of the class, we kind of rolled something together and uh, she taped it and she brought out some temper paint and, and did this to it and pulled out a chair and sat me up in it and put the hat on me and it was a dunce cap that said Spanish on it. And she went like this and my cousin who had taken me to school on my first day later explained to me that she said, uh, very insulting things to me and basically told me I couldn't take the hat off until I learned to speak English. And of course, that was a day that I understood what declaration of cultural war was all about. And um, she had no idea that my uncles had fought in World War II, had been decorated, that my father had also gone to World War II, that I had already been uh, inculcated in many of the rituals and uh, understanding of what it takes to uh, respond to such an insult. And um, I was a little bit more than game to engage in warfare from day one. And so um, being such a little guy, um, uh, which I was actually a very uh, small child, I guess, um, but very alert, I kind of began to understand that uh, I'd have to possibly take an alternate route than what was being presented to me. And so um, as it turns out, that's exactly what I did. Um, and I will get to some art, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, getting to the art. Um, uh, and so maybe my first project 
uh, was uh, begun because I was a, uh, a television generation child. Uh, there was this, uh, pro this TV show in the 1950s uh, called uh, Zorro, and uh, it was a Disney program. And, uh, and also, I think I even was born before Disneyland existed, right? So uh, it, the, the Zorro was a character, mythical character, and it always ended with uh, Zorro kind of uh, doing his Z on the Sergeant Garcia's uh, stomach, his belly. And uh, so uh, growing up in East Los Angeles, a very distinct form of graffiti was in the area. And I think I learned how to read graffiti before I learned to re read English. And I always spoke in Calo anyway, which is sort of another language that came out of uh, El Paso, Texas, uh, because that's what was spoken at the home. Um, uh, there was a friend of mine who, uh, with a crayon, uh, I caught him uh, doing graffiti in the school, and it said Zorro. And uh, I looked at it, and I said, well, you know, that's pretty good, but not good enough. And I said, you know, I know where there's a big, giant crayon. And uh, this was before they used to use uh, spray cans. Uh, they used to use these big, large things that looked like crayons to mark on the road. Uh, and so uh, I said, you need to help me. And uh, I wrote the zero uh, O R R O. And I said, now watch this. And we went like this. And I said, just follow me. And uh, took this big, fat crayon and stretched that Z for three and a half blocks. <laughs> till in the end, we wound up with a little tiny crayon. And I put it back in the box. And so maybe that was the first project. <laughs> um, first approach to graffiti as being sort of a public engagement. Uh, of course, I was caught. I was punished severely. Uh, this was during the era when um, uh, corporal punishment was allowed, um, which uh, it was uh, uh, definitely meted out to students uh, quite often. Um, attending the public schools that I, that I went to, um, it turns out that the elementary school, the junior high school, which is now called a middle school, and the high school, which is known as Garfield High School in East Los Angeles, it turns out they were all nationally recognized for being the worst performing schools in the United States at the time. In 1969, it had the highest drop, uh, Garfield High School had the highest dropout rate in the country. It also had the highest levels of um, certain kinds of illnesses, uh, the highest representation of, um, of young men who were drafted, uh, graduates who would immediately get drafted uh, probably on the day of graduation. Uh, they would get their diploma at the end of the hall. They'd get a letter, also from the draft board. They were all dying in Vietnam. Um, it turns out that uh, a lot of the conditions were very bad. And I had kind of already figured this out because I'd been always engaging in things. And uh, by the time I was in the 11th grade, um, uh, having read quite a bit uh, other than what had been offered in the schools, I was, um, had learned to speak English for fairly well because I was reading all the newspapers and all the magazines and uh, a lot of literature, um, hadn't done any homework whatsoever, and didn't pass any classes at all. I've never passed a single class in my entire lifetime. I had a 0.0, .0 GPA. Um, it actually, in the end, they gave me extra credit, somehow mythical uh, liars uh, gave me uh, a 1.1 GPA so I could get out of there. Um, but I became a, um, a student leader in what, what ultimately became known as the um, Chicano Student Walkouts of 1968. Um, of course, this is now sort of celebrated in Chicano culture. But um, in 1968, uh, I was part of uh, the group of people that we all organized to make sure that we would all protest on behalf of improving educational opportunities uh, for young people. Uh, we were also, of course, uh, protesting against the war in Vietnam, but we were also protesting on behalf of uh, civil rights and human rights. And for that effort, of course, um, because this was sort of a very dark period of time, this was during the Nixon administration, um, uh, sort of the uh, onslaught of a, of a response to people fighting for the rights was to make sure that uh, many people were jailed or put on, um, on different kinds of lists. Uh, I think my name was on a list of a, an organization that's a couple blocks from here, which I won't mention their name today, uh, but uh, they are in control of uh, federal crimes. Um, they, um, they created a list of people, and they would uh, refer to people that were fighting on behalf of the civil rights as being subversives. And, um, and of course, back then, that carried a lot of weight. And of course, uh, people on this particular list, maybe many of them actually had very difficult experiences. Uh, and many of them died mysteriously. And, um, but some, uh, 
Some who talk quick and walk fast seem to still be here. Okay? And um, it turns out that uh, the 1960s were very, um, a very condensed period of cultural um, conflict. Uh, it was also in this whole period where you have this sort of alternate culture of people creating uh, art and music and, uh, and, uh, and everyone being open uh, and everything being about America. And yet the discussion of America often excluded the people I came from. It was not included. Uh, it wasn't even included in being called the other. It was sort of the absence. It was a, that's what it was. It was a silence. And so uh, my understanding of uh, my role, um, particularly having been involved in the student movement and actually having been placed on a list and having suffered uh, certain kinds of uh, experiences that, uh, and then finally, uh, in maybe about 1971, being present at an extremely violent encounter that I've recently written about um, in an online journal titled um, East of Borneo, um, I was present at an event where uh, 25 uh, uh, Alley County police officers open fired with live ammunition into a crowd, killing many people, injuring many people. I know exactly what it sounds like to have bullets fly on both sides of me um, and see people fall. And um, uh, c these constant layers of surviving moments, um, well, it, it informed me that um, it's important to respond to such events. Um, but also, it also informed me that uh, there are ways to deal with issues and the wrong way is to really stand in front of police officers with guns. And in fact, it's the wrong way is to come to the attention of people that simply just want to imprison you and punish you. And it's quite possible to still say the same thing and instead uh, reach a much broader audience and possibly persuade other people to change their opinions. And so, um, about 1972, after having gone through quite a number of things, uh, always having been a visual uh, person, uh, I felt that uh, it would be possible to take photographs and maybe share some of my stories. And it might also be possible to alter um, the perceptions of the people that I come from, which are Chicanos, Mexican Americans, um, people refer to different terms, but specifically my experience was a Mexican-American experience. Um, I was very much in tune also with uh, Hollywood. Uh, East LA is, is uh, seven miles away from Hollywood. You could stand on any rooftop in East LA and see the Hollywood sign. But um, all during the era that I grew up, you could stand on anyone's roof, see the Hollywood sign, but you'll never get there. You'll never be in a movie, you'll never be on television. And if you do see yourself, it's a negative stereotype and the negative stereotype goes everywhere. You either are, uh, uh, you know, of any negative aspect will be projected across the country and that's what people are going to believe. And so I found that um, uh, the importance of, of media uh, would be something that would be uh, a valid target to subvert. And so I felt that maybe there would be a way to create images, um, create actions, create words that could some way uh, intercede on the negativity and even to the extent that it would, uh, I guess the term is obfuscation, uh, to in some way um, cause people a little bit of confusion, not become very clear on it, and if they need to get clear on it, they might come back and ask a question and they might actually ask somebody who might give them a proper answer or at least one that's not the same thing you get by changing the channel on TV. And, um, and so I would, uh, uh, I guess it was right after, uh, actually literally in the midst of a tear gassed, uh, clouded riot, I uh, encountered somebody that I had known, uh, her name was Francisca Flores, and she had a, a publication titled Regeneración, which is the same title of, um, of, uh, of a publication that was put out by the Flores Magón brothers, uh, which was uh, published out of uh, East LA during the Mexican Revolution. And, um, she handed me this uh, literary journal and I felt it was kind of an interesting thing and I sent her a letter and she said, good, now you're the editor. <laughs> and so um, the first thing I wanted to change was the way it looked because it had no images in it. And so I went out and I sought uh, people that I felt had a little bit of a, of a message through their work. And I approached um, four artists uh, 
uh, Willie Heron, Patsy Valdez, and Gronk, but I also invited uh, a person by the name of Mundo Mesa, and he uh, decided not to participate. Um, even though Mundo Mesa had influenced uh, Gronk and Patsy in a great big way uh, through his work, he had done performance work with them at some point. Um, we all worked on this publication, and by working on the publication, we got a chance to really know each other, and it turns out that we all had the same experiences and many of the same kind of influences, and we all, in some level or another, had kind of survived it all because we kind of had this kind of dark sense of humor. And, um, and so, as it turns out, the, uh, much of what OSCO did as a group and, and uh, uh, originally was to create things that would somewhat mockingly reflect on different events, um, or uh, satirically, uh, uh, you know, refer to things and um, and utilize um, found objects and uh, and the streets. And I had basically had been on the streets my whole life in L.A. and I and I still am, um, and uh, use some of the skills um, that we each had uh, individually to contribute to this group. Um, whereby we would all be able to coalesce and make things. And so we created um, street performances, we created photographs, um, but we also created videos, and maybe that's where I'm gonna begin. And uh, maybe I'm kind of starting towards the end of OSCO, and then I'll go back and retrace it, because this was actually made in 1985. Uh, a little introduction to this video. Um, in 1985, I, was, um, I heard of what's known as uh, public access, uh, uh, TV, which was a part of the federal legislation that a cable television station should allow the public to use their channels and their equipment. And so I went out and made uh, maybe 50 short videos. I would uh, shoot the videos in one day, edit them the next day, and then they'd be broadcast the following day. And because uh, in this era, um, uh, it was possible to actually uh, create a video that would be shown in, in Los Angeles. There were some companies that were hooked up to several million people uh, throughout the state. And so I would create these videos uh, basically for a zero budget that were then shown to millions of people. And for some of these videos stayed on for 10 years, would just show every single day uh, until people complained that their children couldn't sleep. Uh, so, um, so this piece is titled uh, Baby Cake. And uh, it's a five minute long piece, so please uh, bear with it and we'll show the video now. I can't stand this. I remember when my, my life was in full control. I had money, cars, houses, businesses, men. Everything was wonderful. But then the baby came. If only he would have died during delivery. But no, he had to be a healthy 150 pound bouncing thing. If only he had a simple way out of this domestic trap. If only you'd choke on your flakes. You've got to use child psychology, mother. Mama, who was that? What are you talking about? Your father's coming home for his monthly visit. Papa? Papa? We want him to go for full custody, don't we? I hate Daddy! He never buys me any toys! Your mother's little darling. <laughs> now eat your crumbs while I wait for your Daddy. Always waiting. Waiting for money. Waiting for man waiting for life to go smoothly. Are you Marie Antoinette? Here's my ID. Where did she go? Oh, 
What's the use? Dad's home! How's my lovely family? You're a sick man. We don't see you for a whole month and you expect us to be happy? But look, look, I always bring gifts for you. Like, look, there's nail polish for you, and that's for the baby. Have one. I hate you, Daddy! I'm going to kill you! And how's my little baby boy? What a rude father. He should at least kissed his son. No, Daddy, you know how baby gets. He's very nervous. No. I really wouldn't know, would I? Why do you always have to stay away from us? Don't you know that I love you? Love is only a figment of your imagination. <laughs> At last I'm free! Free of changing diapers, free of beating that brat. No more alimony, no more once a month headaches. Look at the two of you, I'm shocked and disgusted. Is this what modern parenting is all about? I put in my time. Well, for all I know, he may not even have been my son. You'll deny anything, he's a spitting image of his father. Yeah, but what are we gonna do about the body? I'm taking him back with me. He'll have a good home forever. Well, I think I'll see you later, baby. Um, arrivederci. Uh, so long. See you later. Aloha. Uh, hasta luego. Uh, uh, bye. I guess I didn't have to uh, send you the check this morning. See not you later. so fast, little boy. You're not through with me yet. I've done better than usual. Now I have two men to depend on my love and affection. And I don't want anyone to, to depend on me or me to depend on anyone. At last I'm free. At last I'm happy. about 50 of these, uh, only a handful actually still survive. Um, the um, UCLA Chicano Studies Research Center put a collection of these together, and so I guess some are still around. Um, maybe I'll show a few images of the work. Um, oops, let's see. Maybe I did something. Oh, here we go. In, um, in 1972, um, I took a tour of the Los Angeles County Museum. Um, at the time, it was the only venue by which um, art, uh, international art could be shown in Los Angeles. It was like sort of the premier uh, location. Here we have Washington, D.C., and we have uh, 
museums on every corner in Los Angeles, we had one. And it was next to the tar pits of all places. Oops, we lost it over here. And so um, I, had, uh, I was 21 years of age at the time. And I took a friend, uh, trying to impress her. Uh, I guess at that point, I must have thought of myself as an artist. I wasn't wearing a beret, though. Uh, but um, uh, I got to the end of the, the museum, uh, looking at all the work. And then it occurred to me, uh, again, coming from my background and my experiences being so involved in the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, it became very evident, uh, glaringly evident, that there wasn't any Chicano art in the museum. And, uh, and it seemed kind of strange to me because Los Angeles is actually the second largest Mexican city in the world, and Mexico City is the largest city in the world. And so I, um, uh, not exactly being uh, uh, aware of the protocol and not even caring about the protocol, I just started knocking on doors and kicking doors and, and eventually found myself in the inner sanctum of the chief curator and demanded to know why there wasn't any Chicano art. And I kind of caught him in the middle of pouring his martini and he turned around and he says, well, you know, uh, Chicanos, they, make, they don't make art, they're in gangs. And uh, kind, of ref kind of was like an echo of my first day in kindergarten. I kind of, uh, first of all, I admired his approach to making that uh, martini, but I kind of left and uh, decided that we would come back and in, in sort of gang-like style, uh, we would come back and approach uh, the museum, but uh, give him the opportunity and give the museum an opportunity to exhibit Chicano art by signing the lower right-hand corner of the museum, thus creating the museum itself being the first work of conceptual art to be ex exhibited at the museum. And, um, and so I came back the next morning with Patsy Valdez, took her photograph, but the um, graffiti on the wall, our signatures, uh, lasted there only less than 10 hours. It was whitewashed, but I took a photograph and I made um, uh, several hundred copies of the, the 35 millimeter slide and mailed it all around the world to different people. Uh, this is prior to computers being around. I did a little bit of research who might enjoy looking at this image. And um, as it turns out, some people responded uh, to it. Um, and uh, as a result, it kind of became very apparent to me that this would be a way to kind of directly deal with people was to send them things uh, directly through the mail. And so um, it was kind of one of the early approaches to distributing imagery because um, it would be so difficult to get work included in uh, literary journals or art journals or um, uh, because everyone was ignoring the work in the first place and everyone was ignoring Chicanos in the first place. There would have to be another way to get out into the world uh, and to reach beyond the local uh, East Los Angeles constituency and the local Los Angeles in California but to, in some way, reach an international audience. And, um, and for me, the most direct way and the least expensive way, because I never had any money in the first place, was to put things in a print form and mail them directly to people that might have some level of influence or at least some form of a memory or might possibly be able to discuss it at a dinner with other influential people. And so uh, I would start sending, sending things, either uh, small photographs or things that were printed, uh, there was a project I did in the 70s titled A Young Boy in the 50s, which was based on a, um, a small child uh, who was out uh, combating uh, uh, the uh, 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 Immigration and Naturalization Service and uh, um, uh, fighting, uh, fighting deportations on behalf of the Mexican people. And we sure could use them today. I know that the Supreme Court just approved of some of Arizona's uh, nefarious laws uh, today. Uh, and so, um, uh, but this character uh, was combating basically um, uh, the officials and in the end he was killed because they put a bomb in his birthday hat and so he was a child that uh, was exploded and um, I would send these out in a serialized form um, over a 12 month period and uh, as it turns out, uh, I guess it was the Museo de Carmen, uh, Carmen Carillo Hill in Me Mexico City uh, decided to assemble them all and included them in a, in a, in a museum exhibition in 1978. And um, it was through this kind of uh, introduction of some of the mail art uh, started appearing in different countries on exhibition or started being included in various scholarly discussions and actually um, uh, caused the introduction to a woman by the name of um, Zanita Vargas who actually wrote the first dissertation on OSCO, uh, University of Michigan. And that was kind of my introduction sort of to um, uh, sort of the scholar 
uh, and uh, people that were doing uh, research on art and sort of the connection to social causes. Um, and so this became sort of a focal point of the, of the group. And um, I'll show you a few works from Moscow here. Uh, we did various performances. This one was called the uh, Instant Mural. Uh, and uh, the corner, the street corner, is uh, Arizona and Whittier Boulevard, a very important uh, corner. This is exactly where the corner where the police had assaulted people with the, the rifles. Um, and um, this project was that uh, Grunk would tape Patsy Valdez to a wall with a roll of masking tape and uh, also taped Humberto Sandoval, who was another member of the group uh, for a while. Um, and the performance lasted as long as it took to tape them to the wall. And then they remained motionless for a little while. In the process, of course, people got out of their cars and were worried about Patsy. They wanted to know if she needed water, she needed food. Uh, did they want them to kick Grunk's ass? Um, and um, uh, it, actually what happened was they remained motionless and then they pulled away. And so then part of um, the project was uh, at a later point, within the area of East Los Angeles, flyers were created with this image uh, describing what uh, had taken place to some extent, that uh, quite often repression and victimization requires an, an active participant of the individual who's being victimized. And sometimes it's a psychological ploy. You simply have to say no. This also um, took place uh, not too far from the same corner, uh, and this is uh, near a photograph. Uh, uh, this is actually the location where people were really being shot at. Uh, this is where all the victims were, where they fell. And uh, through the county of LA, they uh, imposed eminent domain and dug up all the land and eliminated all the evidence so there was never actually an investigation. And they built this very nice, friendly road um, that led directly to the LA County Sheriff's Department, uh, which actually housed military hardware for several years and imposed a curfew on East LA for, um, during the period of uh, 1972, 73, and 74. And this was at the end of 74, and we decided that we should go out and uh, create some kind of an event that would announce that enough is enough. And, um, and so this, this is titled First Supper After a Major Riot. This, um, this is titled uh, Gores. Uh, like I mentioned before about OSCO, uh, quite often we would uh, kind of make a commentary on some of the pop art that was going on. And the gores uh, were basically, uh, the, the rumor was, and, and OSCO was all about generating rumors and myths all the time, particularly in the neighborhood. And um, with the rumor we had started spreading was that Leslie Gore, the famous pop singer of the 60s, had had illegitimate children and they were out uh, uh, meeting out justice to petty criminals. And uh, we had proof, we showed them the photographs. And uh, this image, um, this was taken in the later uh, 70s. Um, about this time, uh, Willie Heron, who's to the right of the drain pipe there, and Grunk, who's to the left of there, had been recognized internationally as being um, very gifted muralists. Um, and their first uh, international uh, uh, description came out of the annual report from the Exxon Corporation, of all things. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, and I'm not sure if uh, they got hold of uh, somebody else's name when that ship crashed. They called it the Valdez. But um, um, this piece, uh, we took a picture of it because uh, Grunk and Willie, uh, we kind of sort of uh, fought sort of the other stereotype that you could only be an artist if you were a muralist. And uh, so we would do different things. And so we titled this one, which is sort of a commentary on muralism, we titled it Asshole Mural. And, uh, and it's, it's actually shown quite a bit everywhere. Uh, so, um, and this piece here, uh, which is a little bit fuzzy, but that's the way it is on the, on the computer. Um, uh, in the late 1970s, the uh, Los Angeles had two competing newspapers. Uh, one was a Hearst newspaper known as the LA Herald Examiner. The other one, the Los Angeles Times, when it was a real newspaper. Uh, and they would compete, and uh, the focal point during the late 70s was how bad East LA was because of the gang wars. And the way they would respond to the gang wars was they would report the name of the victim, the gang affiliation, where the brothers worked, where the sisters went to school, where the parents lived, um, 
providing the, almost the license plate numbers, giving a full description of the entire family, and sometimes even showing the family members. And of course, the next week, they were the murder victims. And then, of course, it would just go back and forth. And basically, the media was uh, fueling these wars. Uh, and, um, and so I came up with the idea that maybe I would take a picture of the last gang member to ever be killed in East Los Angeles. And then I would uh, probably put on a suit like this and go to all the different uh, news directors uh, of all the independent television stations in Los Angeles and convince them that I had a scoop for them. And so and one evening in 1976, this image was screened on um, six different television channels in Los Angeles and announced as being the last gang member ever to be killed in LA. And basically there was a lull in gang activity in East LA for about a month. And, uh, and of course this is Grunk, we laid out some flares and um, somewhere along the line, I guess it was at an exhibition called Global Conceptualism, I guess this was put on one of their high points of the 20th century. And um, often the idea of just creating imagery that would serve as iconic, uh, alternate, uh, and this is uh, something that was part of um, uh, something known as the walking mural, again sort of dealing with the muralism, and this story was a, a mural that became bored of being a, a two-dimensional object that decided to go out and take a walk and uh, walked on Whittier Boulevard, and, uh, and uh, here we have Patsy Valdez on the left as a Virgen de Guadalupe in black, and Gronk as a, oh, I don't know, he's like an, an inverted Christmas tree, actually, and this, I'm not sure if I have a color photograph of this image. This particular image also uh, appeared in the 1980s. Um, the interest in Chicanos in Mexico, um, it, uh, there was kind of a sort of a, an introduction. I wrote a piece for the La Opinion, which is a, a Spanish language newspaper, and I did sort of a special feature on Chicano art, and I took this photograph as kind of uh, incorporating Chicanos, but of course half of the people there are made out of paper and uh, don't exist at all. And, um, and this photograph um, wound up being uh, published in the newspaper, but I had no idea that the La Opinion was um, distributed primarily throughout Latin America, which was my introduction to the Latin American countries. But one of the events that took place this, uh, we have what's known as a condition in LA known as the Santa Ana winds, which are these desert winds that blow in very hot and dry. And after we took the photographs, it started getting windy, and these characters flew up into the air and flew into the freeway and were run over, and everyone called 911, and everyone said the three people had committed suicide, and um, it uh, just part of the LA chaos. Uh, um, this was also one of uh, these kind of images that kind of was perpetuated throughout, and this is titled No Canary. Uh, and actually this, I think, is in, on the uh, homepage of uh, Tomasi Barofrosto's Smithsonian page as one of his favorites. Uh, this was titled No Phantoms. Um, throughout uh, my work in, in art, I've often used uh, performers um, and so these are things that have gone on beyond OSCO, uh, working to create uh, these moments uh, uh, that have all led up to my current work, which are photonovelas, um, which uh, were very popular in the 1950s in Mexico and throughout Europe, and I think uh, even Fellini made a film titled White Chic based on a photonovela star in Italy. Um, I've decided that uh, possibly it's a, a way to express uh, not only cultural um, influences, but sort of responses to the 21st century, uh, where Chicanos might be, where they might be going, where they should have gone, what they might have looked like, what they probably should have looked like. Um, so it deals with fashion, it deals with politics, it deals with radiation, it deals with uh, immersion and uh, multiple ways of looking at things. And so they're always sort of like a pseudo, uh, hyper dramatic uh, poses. Um, and it turns out, of course, that the people that I use uh, nowadays are in some way or another involved in academia or in politics, or, um, and for instance, here we have uh, Victor Carrillo who went to Princeton, and we have Mario uh, who actually writes about Oscar and teaches at Amherst, and uh, Jennifer Sternad who graduated from uh, Harvard, and, uh, and all these different people that do things, but yet they look like movie stars and uh, they act like movie stars, but they're not in movies, they're in photonovelas. And um, uh, many of the people that I know, uh, this idea of being super expressive is, uh, goes back to my earliest years because, um, again, I mentioned the term calo, which is sort of a, a, sort of a, a sub-language out of uh, El Paso, Texas, and sort of it was the, the language of the Pachucos. 
is there's sort of the traces of the pachuquismo in my work in the sense that everything was designed to create an impression in a moment. And, um, and I was explaining to Carmen that uh, I was taught at a very early age that uh, the theory and the concept truly of a pachuco was to form yourself into a diamond. And um, the way diamonds are created, of course, is through intense pressure and heat. And if you do it properly, you get a diamond. And if you do it wrong, you're crushed and you fail. And so the goal is, of course, when confronted with heat, when confronted with pressure, it's best to shine. And so, um, and here, father and son, right? And so uh, this is Umberto Sandoval. And, um, and of course, the idea of creating uh, uh, figures that look like they're very high fashion, uh, but you'll never see them in Vogue. You'll never see them in the, in the interview magazine. You won't see these people on the national um, readership level. I dare all of you to go to any bookstore today and look at the magazine racks, and you will see that there's a complete void of Chicano imagery there. You might see one or two actors, but nothing that resembles or is left up to something that could co-exist uh, and of co-equal value and accept that it's actually out there and it's being missed. And as this is my dear friend who passed away a couple years ago, uh, but uh, again, you know, someone that looked like she could have been uh, co-equal to Dolores Del Rio, but worked in a factory her whole life and uh, is no longer here. And, um, and these are scenes from the fotonovelas. Uh, again, sort of this hyper-emotional um, subject matter, uh, always usually related to sexual relations or, or something going wrong with uh, personal love affairs. But in the end, it's all about um, creating havoc and yet humor and sort of at the same time a political point and actually, politics are not much different than that anyway. And for instance, uh, this is Maria Su, who's also working on her PhD at uh, UCLA at this point. Um, same thing with these people here. Uh, these ideas of sort of encapturing these moments. Uh, the fotonovela, of course, will have these little text pieces. And I believe that's probably going to be somewhat poetic when it's all written, um, at, at when they come out. Um, and here we have uh, sort of these moments, uh, maybe a moment that one or two of us might relate to, and this is probably the universal moment. And uh, there's Gigi, right? Um, in, in 1991, um, I st started work on a series titled Chicano Male Unbonded which was my response to negative um, media imagery and a commentary on the radio one day. I turned on my radio on the car radio and I was about to leave somewhere and the announcement was, be careful, he's a Chicano male, uh, beware. Uh, police are after him and then it went to commercial and I said, are they after me? Are they after my father, my son, my uncles, my friends? And I started thinking about all these uh, concentric layers of uh, interrelationships and I kind of felt that, you know, there's been many times when I've been stopped on the street how I might look to somebody if I'm in a dark street and suddenly the light's on me. And so I decided I would photograph these people that were very important to me on the street as they might be encountered and, um, and just start photographing them, documenting them. And so this is Umberto Sandoval, and he's an actor, but he's also been a businessman for many years. And um, this is Jaime Villaneda, and he's a curator. And this is when he was working at the Getty, and I guess he just recently graduated from uh, NYU. And this is my father who never wanted to be photographed, um, but I managed to uh, photograph him one day uh, in a little favored corner that he would hang out at sometimes. Um, and this is sort of a well-known painter, Solomon Huerta, um, who insisted that I photograph him a second time. Uh, so there's been a few times, and this is the second photograph, by the way. This is the one he approves of. Uh, some, some men I have photographed them many, many different times because they are constantly evolving. And then every once in a while, it's the image that kind of solidifies who, who will, they will be in, in memory. And, um, and, uh, and then this is Rodolfo Acuna, who is uh, known as the godfather of Chicano studies. His book is banned in Arizona. And... Um, and he's a quite gifted uh, spokesperson and uh, has been influential in my life in, in the sense that he allowed me to attend college when I didn't deserve to go to college and prevented me from going to Vietnam. And so I thank him profusely um, for uh, uh, interfering 
with that uh, unjust war. And in any case, um, it's been a pleasure talking with everyone. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I guess we need chairs. We have chairs right here. We could just move them here. Sure. Here, I'll help. Here, I'll get that. It's okay. Just excuse me for a second. I'm going to just put something. Thank you, Harry. Uh, that thank was wonderful. You. And thank you for bringing a little bit of LA to the East Coast. Yes, <laughs> I've been traveling a lot, so I have really have a much better sense of how diverse uh, the United States is in terms of urban environments and, and histories. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really wonderful to see uh, these great images of Aspo's early performances. And you talked a little bit about how um, the public responded to the instant mural, but I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how the public responded to some of your performances. Well, um, every once in a while, the, much of the work that we would do would be on site, unannounced, uh, no one would be invited, um, and so it's sometimes it would be just people who happen to be there, and um, every once in a while people would want to become engaged uh, in the work. For instance, when it was the um, uh, walking mural, uh, where uh, Patsy was dressed up as a Virgen de Guadalupe and they walked in silence for a mile and a half and uh, uh, people were confused. Was it a religious procession? Was it some kind of political act? Um, but along the way, um, collected converts, uh, children, older adults, older people, um, and actually the police also uh, were doing surveillance. Uh, and in the end, of course, uh, the process was that we were going to go and uh, deliver all these costumes to the Marine Recruiting Station, and when we got there, we just emptied all the various uh, costumes at the doorway, and they shut the place down for a day. And so maybe that was a political act, was preventing Chicanos from East LA going to the war at least for one day. Um, in um, the instant mural, for instance, it actually, I guess the physical, visceral response was that someone was in danger. Everyone kind of understood in a way that there was some level of repression taken on. So some people, um, wanted to uh, rescue uh, the victims, as it were. And, um, and yet, at other points, people would either become, um, uh, they might actually enjoy it. Uh, at, at, uh, and I talked about this, Carmen, about doing the photo novellas. Um, my photo novellas originally started as sequential series of um, slide images with audio recordings. I would create these narratives in a particular location, like say a si particular city block that would involve two or three performers and then project them on the exterior walls with audio uh, speakers and people in their own neighborhood would get to find out what was going on indoors in their own neighborhood and then people would wonder about each other uh, were these true or were these not true uh, and the idea again of causing sort of a discussion um, and people responding and some people would become very angry some people would become very upset and uh, basically, that's where the term Osco came from. They would go, Medan Osco, uh, you know, uh, you make us sick. Uh, and yet, uh, and even the name Osco um, came out of a confusion. Uh, we had uh, had a show uh, at a place called Self Help Graphics in 1974 after we had been together for a couple years. And we had titled the show Osco, but the way it was laid out on the um, flyer, everyone thought it was the name of our group because we had. Um, made fun of self help graphics and said we were only going to show the worst uh, work possible and all we did was show junk. Uh, in fact, I found, uh, you know, just things that didn't look like uh, they would be uh, things that people would want to see out of Chicano artists. And um, as it turns out, uh, it, that was a name that uh, became sort of self-identified with the group. Um, and um, here and there, I guess, there's been a couple times when people um, might have become a little too involved. Uh, try to pull us out of line or, you know, and uh, so it was always it's kind of risky to do anything in LA that draws attention to you, um, which is part of, um, part of my learning process. So now when I shoot, everything is done very quickly. I have people meet, we shoot, we leave. 
uh, because nowadays in LA, if you shoot anywhere in downtown LA, they will charge you for making a movie, or they will give you a ticket, or they will somehow or another penalize you uh, for bringing out a camera. Uh, and so um, uh, it becomes even, I think it's even more so now than it was in the earlier years. I also wanted to ask you that uh, recent years has witnessed this rise of interest in ASCO. You mentioned several, well, there, there have been a couple of dissertations on the subject of ASCO and, and the upcoming exhibition um, that's retrospective, as well as the Phantom Sightings uh, exhibition, which argued that ASCO's pioneering work has had a real impact on younger uh, Chicano artists working in a conceptual mode. And I was wondering why you think that there's been this flowering of interest in OSCO at this moment in time. What, what has led to that? Well, um, I think part of it has to do with, um, I guess, the introduction of postmodernism, for instance, this mm -hmm. idea of deconstructing things. I think. Um, people kind of looking at themselves and wondering where they all came from exactly and what were some of the influences that occurred and uh, what are basically the missing gaps. And of course the glaring exception was uh, again, like you mentioned, OSCO. Um, and of course uh, with these coming shows, everyone wants to include OSCO because it's been the glaring omission, uh, the denial that uh, this whole population exists uh, and that uh, everyone has been doing work. And um, I think it, a little bit uh, from some of the institutions, it's catch up. Uh, but for some of the people that are involved in the research and some of the artists, uh, maybe it's been one or two of the works that uh, clearly points out that there are ways to subvert media, that there, is way, that there are ways to actually uh, offset, uh, even the term, uh, the fashion, for instance, there's an image I didn't show here, but that will be in one of the exhibitions. Uh, Patsy was known for making... Uh, uh, what was known as tumor hats, uh, these big giant hats. And uh, again, we uh, were very young and weren't uh, exactly very, uh, didn't have much empathy at that point. I've learned uh, a little bit about that since then. But um, this idea that you could have a tumor, wear a hat, and still be fashionable. But these hats became very ridiculous and large, and they were all made out of found objects and fabric. And Patsy would show up with it, and other people would show up with it, and it turns out it became sort of a fad for a while. And everyone actually thought it was something that was something to do. And I'm sure everyone's hidden those pictures, but I'm sure there must be on the top of TV sets somewhere in East LA, people with the wife that has a tumor hat. And so uh, the same with the platform shoes at some point. Um, people would wear platform shoes in the 70s, but Willie Heron and Grunk uh, started making things that were kind of equal to stilts, and some had mouths that would bite, and other things uh, that would trail off, and, uh, and this idea that you could use your body as a form of expression, which again was connected to what uh, that whole period of time was, and uh, this idea that um, uh, using yourself uh, as, a, as, a, as an example, but also as a metaphor of your people, um, could actually have an effect on the media and could actually have sort of these counter effects with the negativity that might have been expressed elsewhere. And, um, and maybe that's where a little bit of the attention and maybe some of the influence, even though uh, many of these artists are doing much work that's uh, removed from sort of a, a, a ethnic identity, but on some level still utilizing the uh, mediated uh, aspect of um, engaging with uh, uh, you know, whatever might be presented to the public through uh, print media or electronic media. And what has been your, the response to your work and Oscar's work abroad? Um, well, there was a, there's a filmmaker by the name of Agnes Varda uh, who um, captured us actually for our last performance uh, in a film called Murmurs. And um, this film was actually uh, incorporated in the, um, it was France's uh, documentary entry for the uh, Cannes Film Festival. But in that um, piece, um, we had explained to Agnes that uh, we were going to recreate uh, all of Chicano history, but then we were going to burn it down. <clears throat> we we're just going to erase everything because it's all gone so badly. We we're going to just erase it and then start afresh. And uh, in the process, uh, we would do other things. So. Uh, uh, Willie and Grunk painted a big mural uh, on a wall, and they were both going to be teardrops falling out of the out of the eyes, which were the windows, 
And um, Willie Heron, of course, tied a rope that was much longer than the length to jump out. So he got a little bit injured. And then I would be the person, um, and my response to France was I was going to be dressed up like a marionette, yet kind of uh, somewhat uh, Napoleonic, uh, with makeup and a, this triangular hat. And I would be the madman burning everything, except that we had uh, no lighter fluid. And so uh, um, we were going to use uh, um, uh, gasoline instead. And so uh, because I used so much makeup and I'd used tar paper that I ripped off the wall, um, it wound up saving my life. And, um, and so, you know, that was one of the events. And I just recognize somebody here who uh, I met years ago, uh, Sean Carrillo, uh, who was involved in uh, one of my early plays. Um, um, and, and Sean, I'm gonna just, if you don't mind, I'm going to int introduce you here, but uh, I um, had gone to this place in the 1980s, and uh, I don't know, I was walking, minding my own business, and I don't know what got into me, and I went and started knocking on a door, and I said, listen, I've written a play, and it's beautiful, and I'm going to get all these people, in the, and then the guy says, oh yeah, that's great, uh, go ahead and do it, and I walked out the door, and I said, well, what am I talking about? I haven't written a play. And I, caught, and I got on a bus, and I turned around, and I saw these two guys sitting next to each other, and I go, that's them. And, well, he's one of them. Um, <laughs> and um, wrote a play called Shadow Solo, which uh, was performed, and it was all about a, a man's attempt to get through a city block in L.A. that was all about, um, um, you know, pure hallucinations, um, which is really what L.A. is all about. Um, things happen in L.A. They happen so quickly, and they dissipate, they disappear. People come and go, events happen, they unfold, and uh, when you get to the end of the block, you just can't believe what you've seen, and there's no one there to testify that you actually saw what you saw. So it's either your memory, it's a myth, and, um, and it uh, was performed uh, uh, very well, and, uh, and it was very inexpensive. It included a sheet of paper and a flashlight, and, um, and the tale was that the, the narrator was being trailed by his shadow, but the, the shadow is so traumatized that the narrator is taking him through such terrible depths that the uh, shadow is constantly trying to persuade the narrator to switch places and finally does only so that the shadow could in the end commit suicide and end it all. And, uh, it, you know, the end. So, okay. I wanted to open up the floor to questions from the audience. If anyone's interested. Thanks for, for coming and talking to us. Um, I guess my question is about um, the influence of the Chicano movement in your art, right? You started by talking about your participation in the blowouts, um, right. but then when you talked about asshole mural, you said that, that the conceptual art was somewhat of a response to muralism, and, and you know, that was really the quintessential form of the movement, the art form of the movement. So I'm, I'm wondering how, as you all developed, you developed in sort of relation or in opposition to what was happening you know, at an earlier moment during the Chicano movement. Well, uh, maybe possibly what was happen happening earlier was um, sort of these very rigid concepts of what was acceptable and what was not acceptable. Uh, the same has happened in various social movements. Um, people define what's acceptable art and what's not acceptable art. And then quite possibly it might be that maybe um, some social movements uh, possibly don't uh, succeed exactly because um, they're not opening up for the varying uh, degrees of participation. And, um, and although the Chicano movement was very instrumental in getting many things started, of course it spread out and became many other things. And so there is a direct connection, but um, clearly wasn't following the party line of that period of time. And, um, and yet, uh, you know, being identified on one level with that group, um, there is always uh, momentum and growth. And many people have grown and some people haven't. Some people uh, become more rigid and more solidified in certain things. And, um, and I think, for instance, even in, in, in conceptual art, there's some people that are so conceptual, they don't do, uh, well, they've done it, whatever it is. And so uh, uh, it, 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 it constantly uh, requires um, adaptation, I guess, to, and I, this is the way I began my dialogue, was uh, part of uh, surviving is to be adaptable to changing times and changing experiences and changing physicality, actually. So here I'm, I'm going to be 60 this year and um, have to be whatever I am at this point. And um, I guess the day I reach 60, I might get the bright idea. I might live to be 70. Mm -hmm. So who knows what's going to happen. But it's, um, it's always sort of a, the acceptance that I need to learn more and do more. And I don't know what the actual answer is uh, because I'm usually working on the next one anyway. 
Yes. Uh, we'll give you the mic because it's being recorded. I don't know if it's, maybe I don't need the mic. It's being recorded actually, so you should speak into the mic. As an Anglo, also grow, grew up in LA, on the other side of LA, one year younger than you, I think it would be helpful for me if you could provide some of the political context, because I'm, it's missing for me. I'm not getting something oh, here. Oh. Because I, like, we can talk about, <clears throat> I guess, the LAPD and firing on presumably protesters. I'm not clear. Are we, are we protesting the Vietnam War? which we were doing on the west side, or is it Chicano-specific um, problems that are going on in East LA? Uh, that question, I, the um, reference to uh, cluster cancer, I've never heard of this before, oh, okay. other than on my high school, where there happened to be an oil drilling rig, and that's right. still being litigated. Oh, that's in Beverly Hills. Yeah. Yeah, right there by Century City. Exactly. Right. But um, so I would think that leukemia situation that you allude to would be, it's in the air. And all well, the people in Hollywood, Beverly Hills, Pacific Palisades would be subject to it as well. Yeah, Unless and again, the winds are blowing east. Right, yeah, <laughs> and then, no, well, no, I, I'm not saying that it only happened in East Los Angeles. I'm talking about my experience mm -hmm. of that time. And, um, and, you know, it's taken me a long time to learn, too, because now I live on the west side. <laughs> so, you know, I'm still in the learning curve. So, uh, so yeah, I understand what you're talking about. So, um, that time period specifically pertained to East Los Angeles. Uh, the particular demonstration where the police fired on people were actually responding to the death of Ruben Salazar, the slain um, journalist, uh, LA Times journalist, who was actually shot with a tear, gas, a tear gas projectile that was designed to go through concrete walls uh, and shot at close range and uh, none of it really making sense. And it actually is a very important issue because uh, it actually came to, uh, they had a big article in the LA Times just a month ago about something that took place 40 years ago. And so um, uh, it, that demonstration also uh, was involved with the anti-war demonstration. Um, the thing about what it was in East Los Angeles was East LA had the largest anti-war demonstration in Los Angeles However, it was primarily consisted of uh, participation by Chicanos, and people from the west side almost weren't there, and from other parts of Los Angeles weren't there, which is also goes back to what my commentary was, was that the way East LA functioned, it usually was a, a disjointed from the rest of the city. And so when things were taking place in West LA, East LA didn't know about it, and whenever anything happened in East LA, people in the west side didn't know about it, and it's only been up until quite recently that there's been kind of a little bit of a crossover and people becoming a little bit more aware of it. Um, and I'm not sure if it has to do with the new media and uh, just sort of this idea that LA, well, if you're from LA, you understand now that we have like 100 different cultures and 500 different languages. And uh, you know, you better be a little bit more willing to understand that there's all kinds of people and you might order a dinner plate and it's got 500 different uh, elements in it and, uh, and uh, you, there's no way to pronounce the title and uh, you might only be able to digest one third of it anyway. <laughs> but I'm a little confused, are you saying it's racially based that people on the west side are out no. of the yeah. against the same war that presumably Chicago's East LA? Yeah, well, you know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that there was a, probably a lack of um, direct communication between the groups. Uh, I'm not talking about racial hatred. I'm talking about the fact that people were not informed of each other's efforts. And so what, what happened was people were actually missing each other. Mm. And, and basically that's really what my work has all been about is that, you know, I don't think you really hate me and I don't think I really hate you, but we really, you haven't had a chance to see what I do. But I've really studied maybe people on the west side. And, uh, and, and let's, we all need to kind of be on the same page as it were. So that's kind of what it's all been about. Uh, I'd, I'd have to say again, going back to the earlier stages, there was a level of militancy that became very nationalized, uh, nationalism, where maybe there wasn't this acceptance that there could be other people. But of course, uh, you know, this is uh, just a different era and um, I think people are more understanding that we live in sort of an, uh, a global 
environment where we're all interdependent and, um, and that we all kind of are um, uh, required to have a, a, an active participation in society so that we all kind of can save each other. And uh, because, um, you know, there's too much hatred as there is. I did talk about today about, uh, and although it's, it's based on federal law, the offshoot is there's sort of a lot of these negative uh, commentaries that take place that kind of drift on um, trying to set the clock back a little bit. And, uh, you know, we've got to make sure that everyone understands that we're, we all deserve to be here, that we are all Americans. And uh, this, I guess, is the right place to say it. Great. Oh. Actually, we'll pass it. So um, do you think your uh, work was, when you were not um, allowed in the museum, do you think it was based on hatred, or they just didn't really recognize you because well, it didn't really register with them? I, I think it has to do with, uh, when I teach nowadays, what I talk, about my, talk to my students is about how you attribute value to something. If you don't have any belief in something, if you don't understand something, if, you don't, if you've never seen it, there's no way to attribute value to something, even though it might be highly valuable culturally, uh, economically, uh, politically. If it, if it seems irrelevant, it has zero value, and it might be destroyed, and it might be just omitted, and it might not be included. And then what it turns out, though, that the final results are a faulty uh, formula uh, where you wind up with the wrong um, summarized uh, conclusion uh, because it's missing uh, an entire uh, factor that should have been included. And so maybe that was my response to the Alley County Museum. Well, there was this glaring omission that nobody really cared about, that no one really knew about. And uh, still to this very day, even though they're having a show, it's not the museum that collects Chicano art. So, you know, they might show it, but then it's going to go back. And so, uh, you know, we'll see if anyone have actually hangs on to anything. But as we know in museums, uh, there's no real serious consideration until someone actually owns it and participates in it and it becomes part of the institution. And then also, because that institution represents a particular aspect of American culture. Uh, but if it's on loan and then it goes back, well, uh, you know, I don't know, I might have a few works that have shown in different places that make great coffee tables afterwards. So, you know, I mean, it becomes of no value. And, uh, and, and then if there's zero reference to it, then it's, uh, it's even less. And if it's done in, a, in, a, in an environment where there has been hatred and where there has been these glaring um, uh, political events that violate human rights on an international level, uh, then you might get the hint that there might be some hatred, but there might not be personal hatred from the people that are involved. It's just part of the overall scheme, schema, as it were. Well, uh, yeah, but um, there, there's also the, the response uh, uh, that I got initially was, uh, you know, they don't make art, they're in gangs. And of course, if you look in the Chicano culture, you'll realize that the gang culture is a, a minuscule aspect of Chicano culture. And, uh, you know, you, you look in the history of, uh, of uh, the military participation of Chicanos, uh, uh, you know, endless rows of people that are heroes. Uh, people that are involved in all kinds of aspects of the workforce uh, and people that have done, uh, uh, I think, even sort of the first uh, suit of the Mendes family uh, that set forth the, the case for the, uh, uh, the Brown versus education. Uh, uh, there's many people have been involved in politics, but of course it, it doesn't get included in the media. So it doesn't get dis dis disseminated as being part of the discussion. And so then it's not included as part of the American dialogue. And, um, and again, so that's basically has been sort of the, um, uh, again, uh, having been born in the United States and yet constantly being asked, what country am I from, which came quite recently, uh, maybe while I was here this week. Uh, and tonight. <laughs> yeah, tonight. Um, uh, it, it's been something that uh, uh, it's, it's my constant assertion that, um, you must pay attention. And, uh, and I guess through art uh, has been my approach, and other people have different ways of doing it. 
Um, but fortunately, um, we're all here tonight. I think it's worth it. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Harry, and thank you for your wonderful questions. Uh, we can continue engaging with Harry upstairs in the lobby uh, on the first floor. Thank you very much. Thank you.